that sort of relies on this sort of gimmick that I'm showing right here, because this was hot really, really quickly, um, and refers to it as sort of uh, reductive of the tradition that it comes from, because it's just, I don't know if you've ever seen the Portlandia sketch of just put a bird on it. Y'all need to look that up, because it became a joke for about 10 years, um, where if you're going to make it artful and high-end, you should put a bird on it. And so people are collecting these little birds and sticking them on artworks. And, and, and for a couple of years in the painting world, it was put a neon light on it. Mm -hmm. So there is indeed camp in Forever Now. And camp is, if I'm going to remind you, there's camp and kitsch, right? Kitsch is generally derided as being sort of sentimental and very much about nostalgia that is sweet. Camp, however, is a little bit more conscious, self-conscious. Um, camp would be like Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Like she knows that what she's doing, do you all know who Elvira, Mistress of the Dark is? She knows that what she's doing is making a farce of horror, and she knows that she is pandering into a male gaze by wearing practically nothing um, and in reinventing sort of gothic sexy, but she's doing that in order to criticize it. Right? So she's self-conscious as she criticizes that thing that she is doing, which is intrinsically kitsch. So there is camp in the forever now, um, and the imagery is, it generally deals with irony and presentation, but they are not the main focus. Painting also seems to have shed its preoccupation with photography, which is interesting. Um, so here you'll find only the faintest nod to the age of mechanical reproduction, and if you remember correctly, last semester I had one of you read that and present on that, Walter Benjamin's Age of Mechanical Reproduction. So if you're interested, you should read it. It's a short read. So even for Laura Owens, who's the painter shown here, who blithely tries on the sort of visual problems of the digital world, photography isn't really a part of her DNA. She is through, through and through a painter, even though these works in and of themselves that you're seeing here are actually digital prints on canvas with paint over them. And so that's the work that she's, she's producing now. So when I say engages with the internet age, that's kind of what I'm referring to, even though they look entirely painted. Which part of paint is it? That would require you to be in front of it. So what does that say? That means art is meant to be experienced, or at least painting is meant to be experienced in situ in front of the object. You are meant to behold it in order to glean these things about its production and how it's made, right? So imagery is indeed still present in this exhibition uh, in varying degrees. So front and center is Nicole Eisenman's paintings. She's uh, well, she, she very much deals with sort of goofy, cartooning qualities um, versus somebody like Amy Silman, who actually starts her paintings from figure drawings, and then they become completely non-object abstractions. So Silman, Amy Silman, and I'll talk about her in a second, is a great picture builder. She is sort of um, creating a, a, a kind of gravitas through design. Um, Representation occasionally peeks through in the tradition of realism, um, but they do transcend, right? It becomes very much about the nature of paint, which is at its core a very modernist endeavor. Paint is paint, surface is surface, which is what Clement Greenberg said. Here we have got the work of Mark Grotjen. Um, he very much sort of holds his own. He's been popular for a good you know, 20 years now since I was in grad school. And he has a sense of structure. It very much is a modernist sense of structure. So like diamonds, Grodgen's paintings are often the result of great pressure um, brought to bear on a malleable material over a, a long period of time. What does that mean? The images on the left, that's a colored pencil drawing. And you've got to press really, really, really hard. It very much is about this sort of layering. The image on the right is an oil painting. So his work is a good example in the way in which many artists today are using imagery and history, which is to say, that the way the artists use, that the way artists mainly always have, right, which is process, process, process. Grotgen manages to simultaneously invoke cubism, futurism, surrealism, and abstract expressionism. Everyone from um, Malevich to Victor Bronner. 
And he translates these impulses into something intensely focused and very much about a schematic composition that leaves just enough room for his hand to do this stuff. They are, at their core, handmade. Here are some other paintings of his. So I think uh, the image in the lower left-hand corner there is actually an image that was created by Joseph Stella in the 1920s. So when I'm talking about this sort of relational art historical model, this is what I'm talking about here. So Grajan's paintings are in the back, and then we have um, Joseph Stella's 1920s painting in the foreground. So you see that there's not, not a terrible difference here. Then we have Aldrich, um, and Aldrich's paintings are sort of, you know, really straddling the line between abstraction and representation. Um, and he's been making interesting paintings for a good while. Um, this is two dancers with haze in their heart, waves atop a remake <laughs> from 2010. Um, and, it's, and it's sort of gimmicky, at least in its, um, in its content, in terms of how it's uh, relating to the title. And it touches both on abstract expressionism as well as a sort of comic era description. And you'll see artists like Joan Mitchell, Philip Guston, Robert Rauschenberg in his work the more you look at it. So you'll see here that the, the, the dominant theme is this sort of relationship from one artist to another. Um, I think Aldrich's paintings, being so reminiscent of old, earlier paintings, maintains a clear sense of contemporaneity in that Hopman, uh, in what Hopman means as atemporal. It's timeless, right? How do you make something timeless? Well, I think I could easily refer to Picasso's Les Mademoiselles d'Avignon as timeless. Even though it was produced in what, 1907, 1906? You could easily hang that painting and say, That's, that looks like it was created yesterday, right? And so by this interplay and this relensing and kind of uh, siphoning from our historical models, we have something that kind of looks as if it could exist in any era. Susan Sontag, famous philosopher and critical theorist, she observed nearly 50 years ago in her essay on style that no self-respecting critic would want to be seen separating form and content. And yet most seem drawn to just do that. After first offering a disclaimer to the contrary, make that double for curators. The real problem with Forever Now is that it has two shows essentially. Uh, there are painters who make standalone paintings uh, we don't need any backstory. And those who use a kind of rectangular surface to do something entirely different. So these artists in the former group are the sort of you know, raison d'etre of the show, the whole purpose. Their work has a formal inventiveness and a pictorial intelligence. Uh, it lives in a moment. As for the latter, these are artists who make tip of the iceberg art. What's on the canvas is the evidence or the residue of what happens off stage. There's nothing at all wrong with this in principle, but it can result in an arid busyness that masks a core of indecisiveness or worse, emptiness. Because what does it require you to do? Well, is it truly democratic if what we require of our viewers is to know art history? So that language is only spoken by a certain select few. So it's a bit like being in a cafe where everyone is speaking a different language and you desperately want to participate. The wall behind you that you see is actually wallpaper of penises. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, is like in order to even talk, oh no, in order to even talk about it, it's really important to sort of know the history of erotic art in order to engage this in a, in a way that doesn't just simply offend, right? So there's another way to see this. There are pictures that repay our attention with interest and there are pictures that simply use it up. And I think that really, darn it, it'll come back, that really does touch on the internet age. Because the most um, sought after thing in the world, the most valuable capital in the world is your attention. So it could be argued that simultaneously nothing is new here. Um, it was once the definition of postmodernism, 
It also describes the way artists selectively consider past art alive and useful and can be a cover for simple derivativeness, unoriginality, a condition not entirely absent from the exhibition. So this plays on a kind of dichotomy, um, uh, two in entirely different things. Um, it, re it, it relies on two extremes, spare and labor intensive, little or no color and lots of it, improvisation and deliberation, and riffs on minimalism and reconsiderations of expressionism, both abstract and figurative. So it really is a pendulum that swings back and forth, right? And, and a lot of what deals with that is thinking about what a painting is as an object. So here we have the work of Charlene, Charlene von Hale. Um, I have a friend who works in DC at uh, the big museum there, and she just did a whole show of Charlene von Hale's. And there really are just, not just, but they really are designs. They're painted designs that at their core are about the delights of abstraction and the beauty of color. And there's another Mark Grotgen, that's out of order. The work of Julie Maritou is also included. Um, is she doing something new with painting? Not necessarily, she's doing something new with the surface. If you've ever seen a Julie Maritou, it probably has 10 or 15 layers of various um, materials that might be spray paint, might be airbrush, might be um, painted on with ink and brush, might be markered on. And they're all dealing with the sort of tracings of maps that already exist that she appropriates from. And here we have some drawings from her. And here we have a large scale work from her. And this, of course, comes from Cy Twombly. It is, ugh, I hate that this is doing this. It is essentially about the entire connection and family tree of art, that one thing does not exist independent of another. The work of Joe Bradley is, um, essentially made with grease pencil on raw canvas. Um, they look a lot like children's drawings. Uh, and I think we can't talk about children's drawings without talking about Cy Twombly. But his, his work essentially is a sort of mass in a way that makes you sort of beg to question whether or not they are pre, uh, preordained designs in and of themselves. The work of Michaela Eichwald is exactly the same thing, except just a bit tighter. They are meant to be displayed in unconventional spaces. Nicole Eisenman, I think uh, part of the sort of faction of artists that deal with this sort of weird uh, figuration, probably the most uh, pay, sought after and paid attention to painting today, at least in New York, um, she explains, quote, I reflect a certain desire in my work. I want my work to be authentic and reflective of my body, what it's interested in. The work is nothing if not feeling based. Influenced by Expressionism, Impressionism, and Pablo Picasso, Eisenman populates her work with emotionally resonant cartoonish figures formed out of the exaggerated. Um, she ultimately sort of pulls on pathos and dark humor I don't know the guy in the middle who's wearing the suit with his pants down, but yet he has a, a, a hiney for his front. Um, they are expressionist portraits of herself and her friends, or just simply imagine characters based on her critical observations of the contemporary life and culture, right? Whether carousing a, at a beer garden or lounging dreamily or in groups or alone, her figures seem isolated and contemplative. They are products of her time, reflections of ourselves. She is also a queer artist, so you will see queer themes of her and of the women in her life. But you will not see consistent style. How interesting is that? Mary Weatherford claims that her paintings are about mortality. Um, she turns to the California landscape as her muse. And I use quotes there because I don't know if I buy that. Um, I don't like her work. Uh, <laughs> She translates the bright and moody colors of the California landscape, tangled vegetation, weathered coastline, licked by the changing sea, into something abstract expressionist, essentially. Um, they are not represent representational compositions. These scenes serve as vehicles for explorations of form, space, and color, and they're triggers for a kind of transcendental, transcendental experience that she's trying to impose on her viewer. 
She works with paint on canvas and typically incorporates this sort of neon tubing and then various things like starfish and shells into her composition. They're sort of um, very much like Jasper Johns used to do or Robert Rauschenberg. And here's a couple more of her works. Makes you sort of think of the world around you already, though. Josh Smith is known for his aggressive gestural paintings. And uh, usually uh, he'll pull in it, it, like his own actual name into the paintings, like the letters, will be uh, sort of fluctuating between the abstract forms. Sorry about that. Um, in recent years, he's experimented with more figurative subjects such as fish, leaves, skeletons, insects. He uses murky color, large brush strokes, and he's not interested in precisely rendering his subjects, but rather exploring the possibilities of abstraction. So some more of his works. And you see his name in that one. And sometimes you'll see a big old name, <laughs> which really is a sort of like, um, I think, tongue in cheek way to address and confront ideas of narcissism, especially in the grand landscape that is contemporary art, which seems to be entirely masturbatory and very much about ego, right? Where do we see that? We see it since the beginning of time, in the caves of Lascaux, in graffiti that that, that, that people just needed to leave their mark behind, right? So that examination, as much as we want to dismiss it, isn't necessarily something we can dismiss. Amy Silman, like I said, she works in a sort of gestural and abstract style. She starts with observational figure drawing and then creates another one and then another one and then another one from the same image in order to develop these completely non-objective abstract compositions which are very timeless, are they not? Very timeless. They are heavily worked, they are heavily layered. I think they're very beautiful. I would own one in a heartbeat. Michael Williams, uh, he was born two years before me. Uh, he negotiates the long history of painting by consistently questioning and often undoing its major components. Notice he's got a completely non-objective piece here and then he's got this figurative piece next door. He challenges himself with an ever-evolving set of formal problems, and he produces images that reflect modern complexity and contradiction. And sometimes they're really weird. That, it's coming up again. It's a lamb. It's, it, it's a lamb. Hold on. It's a lamb. This is killing me. Do you know how much editing? Oh. No. The work of Michael Williams really does sort of gravitate back, back and forth um, between this sort of language that is um, heavily impostoed, heavily attacked, but really indifferent to the constraints of style. Oscar Murillo, um, he uses this sort of calligraphic mark making in, in mixed media and sculptural objects in and of themselves to focus on his fascination with failure, incompleteness, and the studio experience. And these are his words. Using work taken from the peripheries of his studio, typically left on the floor to gather dust, dirt, and fluid stains, he restructures these objects into a new creation. The paintings initially discarded as failures are appropriated and reconfigured as an opportunity to explore archaeology, meaning layers, ruin, and failure itself. In fact, one of the pieces in the exhibition is just essentially a bunch of these paintings on the floor that any member of the audience can interact with, step on, paint on, fold, whatever, in the same way that he creates work in his own studio. And obviously, they're sort of filtered through the stream of consciousness of who he is, Oscar Murillo. He's interested in chorizo. <laughs> Pollo, chicken, yummy, delicious. So he's playing with the notion of identity and abstraction and the refuse of figuring out a way to utilize that which has been deemed useless. This pulls from art history in that um, the Italians, Mimo Rotea being probably the most well-known one, uh, uh, pulls from this sort of um, layers and ex uh, excavation of posters. Mimo Rotea would take, as did Jacques Vigelet, Villeger, sorry, terrible French accent, um, would pull from images taken from poster after poster after poster that they painstakingly removed from the streets 
um, oh darn it, pasted back onto themselves, peeling away in selective layers in order to create new and original works, much in the same way. Rashid Johnson, he, his practice is defined by critical evoc evocations and entanglement with racial and cultural identity, African-American history, and mysticism. So most of his early works are uh, taken in the form of conceptual photography, although his new work m focuses much more on this sort of painterly expression. Um, he looks at the legacy of painting, sculptural installation, and assemblage using manufactured material like shea butter, book records, and incense. And he uses and pulls from this sort of um, really uh, uh, tactile attack of painters like Robert Rauschenberg from the 50s and 60s. Matt Connors is very different. He acknowledges his influences directly from abstract expressionism, Arte Povera, if you don't know it, look it up, and Henri Matisse. Matt Connors pulls from language, music, design, in order to create paintings that simultaneously feel familiar as well as new. Um, this particular work, Foil 2011, evokes the, the, no, this is not the right work. I don't know where I pulled that. Um, but ultimately what he's doing is he's thinking about design as a means to reintegrate the sort of um, application of color and presence through his hand. And of course he's pulling from somebody like Joseph Albers. Diana Molzan, who's probably the least known of all of these artists, um, up until this point in her career, she's been known for exploring the relationship between painting and sculpture through its deconstruction and the materialization of traditional painting materials and tools. So you see that she's literally having an engagement with the strainer or the stretcher bars and then rethinking the object or the color painted object onto the wall. This pulls from modernist image maker Lucio Fontana. If you haven't seen this one, you should definitely know it, where he sliced the canvas in the middle, pulling from the 1950s directly. Kirsten Brach, um, as a German artist, she is questioning the wall itself. She typically uses a lot of layers. Um, she does not traditionally hang her work in any way, shape, or form, so she's painting on various layers of things like plexi, glass, metal, and she might be suspending them, she might be lighting them from behind. Um, she very much is thinking about the screen, I think, right? Um, the glitch and how we interact with those layers. Also questioning the rectangle. Why does the object have to deal with a rectangle? More of her works. I think she's really interesting. Um, I don't know if they're beautiful, uh, in the way that the that maybe a, a 17th century Dutch still life would move me, but I think they are absolutely beautiful in terms of their visual um, impact in terms of color. Richard Aldrich, we talked about him a little bit already. I have a few more images of his work that I won't talk extensively about. Laura Owens, I got to speak. I got to hear speak when I was in graduate school in Milwaukee. I hated everything about the woman. Um, she didn't have a cohesive, interesting thought that she expressed, and it felt like she smoked a big old doobie before her major museum talk. However, it seems like she's grown up a bit. Um, so her paintings run the gamut from abstraction to landscape to figuration. Um, she is very aware of form, um, and she focuses on, on a kind of pop color palette directly taken from the 1980s. She is essentially at her core um, a kind of neo-expressionist. Quote, I often refer to myself as being a per in perpetual student mode, teaching myself to make the painting I want to make. I kind of love that. Here's more of her work and more of her work. And I've explained to you that much of her contemporary work is completely hybrid in digital print on canvas as well as paint. And of course, we can't help but think of designs like this when we look at the work of Laura Owens. It is a design by Diego Orta in probably 1988, I'd say. So the very last image that I'll put up on the screen here is uh, all of the artists that participated. If you'd like to take a photograph of that, you can. Um, the reason why I chose to talk about this show is because I think that there are certain select shows 
in our lifetimes that will change the way painters respond to what they make in the studio. There's this great scene in The Devil Wears Prada when I don't remember the main character's name, but the little ingenue who gets hired who thinks of herself more as a writer than anything. She's dealing with Meryl Streep and she criticizes the, um, the belt color, like it's just blue. And she can't tell the difference between the blues. Do you remember this scene? And Meryl Streep like breaks it, it down and claps back in a way that tells her essentially that her inability to tell the difference between this blue and that blue speaks to her disengagement. And she breaks down the sort of connection between the people who choose those blues in that room at Vogue for what's gonna be on the cover of Vogue um, as filtering out into popular culture and eventually finding its way on the crappy rack at, at J.C. Penney where she bought her outfit. So in many ways, the people in that room defining what this woman doesn't even think about wearing, that she is manipulating without even being, without even being conscious of it. And so I think that, that this is one of those shows. And I got to see this show. I took the students out to uh, New York that year and we all got to see it, and they didn't know what to think of it, which I knew was a good thing. 